Right, so it's another Saturday. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, this is Today's Woman. My name is Nana Ikuya Mensa Brampa, not your regular host. And today we'll be speaking to one superwoman who handles one of the most sensitive organs of children. We'll be right back. Now, talking about the game changers and women making a difference in their community, now let's look at who is the woman for Woman on the Move. This is Sekendi Takuradi, capital of the western region of Ghana. From the breeze that resonates its coastline to the warmth of its people, this metropolis oozes so much splendor. Across its streets and towns, there is an ever-present charm of purpose and grit. Adorned with the glitter of diligence, it offers stories of relentless pursuit of them such as that of 47-year-old Patience Agri, a cold football coach. One player, one, one stake. BM. Yes, Good morning. Patience owns the Asaman Sudo Bayern Munich club, which plays in Ghana's juvenile tier league in the region. Started in 1998, both owner and club have had a fairy tale journey. The beauty that has connected the dots all this well is born out of the need to excel. Since I'm starting, I'm going to be a team that is fun and amazing. I'm going to be a ball, 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 I'm going Number <laughs> Because the have been to school, been to school, school. We can only now go on and make too much food. Not because of better work, but born in it. No more when I have to go to school, go to school. I will share with school in school. She means she has enough for born or for come. Because I'm a me better work, but born. Also, I pay the bill. Wow, what did you mean? Aye, I'm a wow. Born with that thing, born now. Everybody knows. At times, it's a mess. My players need to be busy. No more than I can take my busy. They don't do shama, mama, mude, no, go for the shop. Was in the menu, free juma, nam rain. There will be any be a woman, ma, or she TV, a wobble baller, or you fool. That's a we are can drama, mama. Nozzy, I can't was a boche, I can drama. I'm a men pendum. May be a ball on a chin, I can drama. Patience's hassle fell into the waiting hands of a sport that never stops giving. Today, despite not bearing the full fruits of what should be a gainfully rewarding daily routine, she is at least living her dream. I'm here this year. I'm walking. I don't want to be fear. I need at least many mamba. Yeah, Johnny, my daddy. I owe this beer. No matter how you jump, there, me like football. You know, when you feel baby. Madam, Madam, sorry to say, I don't know. Last two years, we go out of the office, spend a lot of money on kaku, money on kaku, because we don't kaku no sabi sabi. We don't want to make a mess of the world. As the Bayern Munich club has become a regional poster club, while patience, a fortress many look up to for redemption. As a man, the Bayern Munich, what is in that name? That sounds familiar. With another cross, it was Kufour this time, and he just couldn't quite. Wrap his 
head around the ball. The club's name was inspired by former Ghana and Bayern Munich defender Samuel Osei Kofu. As Amansu the Bayern Munich was taking off at a time when Kofu was midway into high flying career, a year shy from a Champions League final against Manchester United. <laughs> Germany, Bayern Munich, team name. I say, before you be a moon, I will be team no actual. Ah, no, no, yeah, Ghanaian. Me feed all yeah, Mukumini. Ah, Obo, Bayern Munich. In fact, Obo, Bayern Munich, Okuno, or Wadron, Nepe, Okuno is my team name. Not a penny bobo. Anytime your bobo be an orchard or a seals. It's a mushrezine, I must know, not to team. Team number two because of Jose Kufunzi. The team number two, Bayern Munich. In the last two decades that she has been at it, her on-field competence and direction has led to many professional football hopefuls getting the needed head start before launching full-fledged careers. In the process, hundreds, including professional first and second-tier clubs, have benefited from a pool engineered by patients. As a man to Bayern Munich has ticked a lot of things for patients, including offering a constant outlet for a community whose young people heavily feed of the inspiration football brings to them. Marco coaching course, more set to do. You see, minimum techniques in Kakra Kakra from grassroots. You see, minimum Nina, no one Malanka Sanus, my Shada, my ball, you can create, but my mo. Mzia just training ara. Mzia at least pass, shoot, receive, move, dash and turn and zi. Mwanka sanka sanka sama zi chemo farmer. Patience continues to hone a lifelong dream of nurturing talent who will be better ambassadors of her resilience. This underlining theme is not lost on these youngsters. I'm so much starting now, I'm a striking team. Most of the time, no go mo pa. Cause I don't many a chance I'm up, but me too me I can't I'm up by charging. I'm bad with go. Then I'm take them. You know, a situation no move for me. No mind them. We put in more effort. I go mo discipline side. Uh huh. I train our players there. Eh, we know as a footballer. Baby, baby, Jimmy, baby, baby, put him a point there. He's a good player. Okay, she's an exemplary figure. When I was moving from her side to join a second division team, all my papers and things, she helped me. She was the only person who was helping out, helping me out to achieve whatever I want to achieve there. But the feet have also come with a fair share of challenges such as financing and juggling passion and career, we're trying to make ends meet. For most sports professionals, this can be daunting and requires a lot of sheer determination. While some successfully merge the two, others give up halfway. But patience continues to hold on, a willpower helped in part by a community that has shown interest in her career and ready to offer support where they can. I work with school. So I to me fears, I'm a papa, me a me be a, me get a one, me go one of my work school. I work with school, and I'm so my fast. Now my work training guns, now my friend, my work make training. So I work training, so I open ten. Some of them are fast, and they are more sudden. They may be a bit crazy in one way. They may not want to show my rest because all the other people who train them are bad. They are not bread. They are not easy. Bit of them are trying to make you fun. They are trying to create it. They are trying to make support football. No, no, no. They are not easy. Now, at times, they are not easy. 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 It's a typical morning for patients who is getting ready for a training session with her team. As a mother of two, 
who also takes care of two grown children, there is every motivation to ensure she stays committed to what is required of her at home before she heads to the training page. Throughout the community, she enjoys enormous affection, mostly buoyed by taking on a career in a largely male-dominated field. To many, she is a wonder woman, made of the steel you find all over Asaman Sudo. But our risk. No tomb or the yet training as in it's a boy at my former man of what banan channel ya maca not saddle on one who could train no so on one year you papa papa or say no but say a new a wonder more from man one as a yana day in kakakra the kakan or all one of whom was a papa papa from all shots the swatch sir and see when you are doing your support for more so the more more than a young na you are more than a boy at home Patients has had to engage in petty trading of various kind to make ends meet while keeping an eye on her coaching career. While she enjoys support from her husband, proceeds from the sale of these products go into supporting housekeeping expenses. She has had to endure hours of bricks trading in and around the township. While she holds on to optimism that the ties may turn, she still represents a tiny fraction of a bigger umbrella of active sports professionals who take up jobs on the side to survive. This is mostly the case since there is a non-existent standard weight structure for sports professionals in Ghana, a situation hard to cope because of prevailing economic conditions. At 47, Patience is willing to do more, but is also aware that she may not be able to do this actively forever. I'm going to go to the house. 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 From there, 60 years going in. Oh, no, Mamma Quanda Munchu me, yeah, the major. And to me, you don't feel to bring. Mazinum Kajina Pempen, so mammy feel dead, my bra, which is the major. But sister, I mean, you look at his minyanje, Mugudada Marie. Patience continues to be a survival symbol for most women in sports in Ghana and Africa. Across various sporting disciplines, where women compete locally, there are the obvious tales of neglect and being treated as second class. That has to change going forward. That's why I'm telling you, Madam, when she down, when she needs to be there, Obi Shamahu Bumpa, man, see, man, can we do this? Jesus, man, we call him. Obi Shamahu Bumpa, man, see. Now, times what by some two months, some by five months, Obi, I'm training one is a. Biya ba madam nyami beshro nyami shwa ba ba mo biya otu miyaro kwa otu mukai cha madam kwama ba ma botu nshwa mohon ane ede ya ibibi nzo biya nje nim onlete maspro to down baby azamuli yami minje right awa shamu kwen de minje from the outside patience appears to be breathing fine even though she has her head under water but sometimes the pushing force of the storm the challenges. The stereotypes at all brings out the hidden scars. This is the face of ambition. You're welcome back. This is today's woman, and uh, well, as I was talking about, she is Dr. Nana Icha Yao, the only pediatric cardiologist here in Ghana. There are millions of hearts when it comes to children in the country, but it's quite interesting to know that there is just one person who can solve the problems of these kids, and she joins me here. So exciting to have you here in our studios. Good. Afternoon. Good to see you. Thank you very much. I hope Nick. you're well. I am well. And Good handling afternoon. the little hearts. How is it going? 
it is um, going, <laughs> um, challenging, interesting, um, but yes, certainly we are looking after the little hearts. Okay, yes. good to know. Now, um, since we're talking about little hearts, we would want to know how your little heart started from your childhood. How was it like growing up? Um, growing up for me was, I would say, very interesting. And when I say very interesting, I mean, I was a child that never wanted to grow up. I actually wanted to be a child forever. Forever young. Yes, <laughs> I enjoyed being a child. I enjoyed, I just enjoyed just being a child, being able to run around, have friends. It was, and I remember I always used to say, I don't want to grow up. Um, so, yes, I uh, went to school very early as a child. Um, I was sent to school, I was, and I was always the youngest in my class. Um, so I went to secondary school at just, you know, when I turned 11 years. And um, by the time I turned 12, I was quite certain that I wanted to be in the field of medicine. That was early. Very early, <laughs> but I, I was so certain about it. Mm. And I guess by nature and by incline, uh, my strong points were in the sciences. Mm -hmm. So that encouraged it. Um, however, it was very interesting because I took my O-levels. I did very well. And I remember saying to my mother, my mother asking me, what do you want to do? My mother is, um, well, used to be. She's a retired lecturer in nursing and midwifery. And I remember saying to so her... So could we just say you picked some thing from her? Well, I, I don't know, but I just said to her that I want to be a nurse, just like her. You know, she was a nurse mm. and then she was a lecturer. And I remember her saying to me that, um, no, Nana, I think you can do better than I have done. So I think you should be a doctor. And I think that was the moment that her words, you know, touched the, the ambition, you know, and the aspiration in me, which... I find very important when we you know we are bringing up our own children and we talk to other people. Because mm. I remember recently my own daughter saying to me that, oh, you said something to me when I was in first year university and that's what spurred me on. So yes, my mother's words spurred me on and I decided that, okay, I'm going to be a doctor. However, a year later when I was doing, uh, when I was in lower six, my dad started putting a lot of pressure on me that, oh, I have to do medicine, I have to do medicine. So then the rebellious teenage spirit came up in me and I said, I'm not going to do medicine. I don't want to know about it. So I changed my subjects and I changed my biology to maths. Okay. Um, and then my headmistress at the time was very concerned because she knew my dad quite well and she knew me quite well and she knew that I'd been doing biology. And she said, what's happened? I said, I want to do engineering. I've changed my mind. <laughs> you know, um, so... Halfway through the semester, I, I think, you know, sense came back so into my head. So your sciences were good and your math was excellent? Yes, yes, it was strong. So I could swap and not have problems, okay. you know. So then halfway through the semester, I think sense came back into my head mm. and I went back to my biology and I finished my A-levels. Well, my yeah. math was terrible, <laughs> trust well. me. I <laughs> well, I always say that I think it's the way maths is taught. I think maths is just, I think it's a subject that has to be taught well. And if you have a good maths teacher, you will do well in maths. That, that's my sometimes, personal sometimes opinion. Sometimes I feel the formulas, they don't apply it well as they are supposed to. That's, yeah. That's why. Yeah, I mean. but I think I, I really am convinced it's the way maths is taught. Because mm. I had an excellent maths teacher who was from Japan okay. at the time. And then bringing my own children up, you know, not all, the, all my children have a very strong incline for maths. But I just realized that when you put them in an environment where you know, you, you teach them in a particular way, it, it does bring out the strengths. Mm. So maths is not that a terrible a subject. Oh, as, well. yes. But as I developed, I, I started getting interest for yeah. it. Yes. Let's, let's look at you, your, you having someone as a role model. Could we say your mom was your role model, considering how your childhood started? Who, who was your role model? It's very interesting. I was thinking about that, actually, and I thought to myself, I don't think I had a role model. Um, but I just, any time I found myself in, a, in an environment, I just found the person who excelled most and did the best in that environment. And I just said, oh, I really want to be as hardworking and as successful as that person. So, um, for example, during my career, you'd have to change jobs fairly often, mm. um, almost every six months. So every six months, I'd say, okay, this guy or this you know, person, oh, I like the way they do things. And, I'm just going to pattern myself. So 
I, I, I wouldn't say I have a role model, which is, I think, a bit strange. I'm wondering. Because <laughs> yes. definitely there should be someone you looked up to. Yes. But it, so it means that you, the environment you enter, you adapt whoever you think yes. is was the best good. in okay. that environment. Okay. Yes. And uh, well, once we're talking about environments, let's enter into the career uh, mm -hmm. of how you started. Yes. You're saying that you started as, uh, was it a general yes. practitioner? Yes, so you, I mean, in terms of medical training, um, you have to do basic things and then specialized things. So, of course, I finished my basic medical training and then um, you do a year of, you know, what they call house job or internship. Okay. So I finished that. And the very interesting thing, and that's, you know, I find it so interesting because um, I trained mainly outside Ghana. And then I came back to Ghana for a year to do the internship. And then I ended up being in pediatrics, which was one of the specialties that um, most of the doctors just did not like because it was really difficult and fairly intense. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was, there was always a lot of emergency. I mean, pediatrics is challenging. So I went into this specialty as a junior, well, the most junior doctor, and I totally, totally disliked it. I mean, I remember promising myself that I would never do this again, <laughs> never. <laughs> And then it was more challenging because at the time, um, it so happened that you know I was married, um, and then unfortunately I had a miscarriage during the pediatric rotation. So I had a bit of a traumatic, you know, unpleasant emotional experiences. And then I had uh, my best friend as well passed away. You know, we were doing pediatrics together and she passed away. So I left the specialty not very happy with it. Um, but then interesting enough, for some reason, when I went back, um, and I, the first job that I, I got, I looked for pediatrics, you know. So there was something in there that was just, you know, drawing me. And I think the challenges were certainly not things that I didn't think I could not, you mm. know. And because I had worked, you know, well, I had had so much exposure in such a difficult environment, um, over there it was, it was really easy. And I was, I was very experienced because I had been exposed to so much, you know, in this environment. So you train for five years in general pediatrics. Okay. Um, and then you do another five years in pediatric cardiology. Um, and I must say, I think I just, I loved it. I, I find pediatrics, you know, extremely rewarding. Mm. I say as adults, when we have pain, we sit around, we don't move, but once a child doesn't have pain and it's better, they're jumping up and down again. So it's a very rewarding specialty. <laughs> and you can never tell when they are even not feeling yes, well. That's right. Okay. Now, uh, working with men, yeah. women, how was it like? Especially for the women bit. Yes. I think working, I mean, definitely pediatric cardiology is a male-dominated um, specialization. Um, and I think when I was training, I was the only African girl and plus another um, you know Caucasian girl and everybody else was a guy okay. you know and it, it, it can be intimidating if you allow yourself to be intimidated I think the important thing is to you know um, just make sure that you, you they know who you are and they know that you're very capable and once they are aware that you're capable I think that guys treat you as their co-equals as opposed to you know looking down um, or treating you as less than. And so um, I must say that I don't think I ever had any experience amongst my colleagues, amongst my peers, of them thinking that I was less than or I was a woman. I think, if anything at all, the most challenging thing would have been my height. <laughs> um, because most guys would be taller than me. Okay. And sometimes when you have to work together, you know, when we do like keyhole surgery, cardiac catheterization, you need the surgical table to be at a height that is comfortable to work with. So if you're working with someone who is too tall or too short, that can be a bit of a challenge. Mm. Um, but it was not in a negative way. It okay. was just something that we had to deal with. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's uh, look at your role as a, a pediatric cardiologist, That's right. right? Yes. And in terms of youth development, yeah. how has your career or role impacted when it comes to you develop it, knowing very well that you work more with kids? Yeah. I wouldn't say that um, it, it would be a little bit difficult to connect the professional with the social mm, aspect. Okay. I mean, I have served in youth and roles um, outside of my profession. So um, in the previous years, I would have been the PTA chair 
for the secondary school that my children attended, um, Christian High School. And that really got me involved with the youth, okay. um, you know, and with being able to talk to them about what they want to do, their careers, be it in the humanities, be it in the sciences. Um, I do get the opportunity to speak to children and to, yes, adolescents a lot, particularly when they have health problems and their parents. But that would be kind of, so it's fairly limited in mm. that way, yes. Okay. All right. And uh, we, we were talking about the challenges. Yes of being in a male-dominated area. What other challenges have you faced for the past uh, 13 years in pediatrics, cardiologists? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the thing about my role or the specialization is that it's a specialization. Pediatric cardiology cannot be practiced um, in isolation. Um, it, it cannot be practiced in isolation. You need you need the team members. So you need the pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon, okay. you need the pediatric intensivist, you need the pediatric anesthetist, you need your intensive care nurses. So pediatric cardiology really is teamwork. And I think that's one of my greatest joys, to be able to work in a team to make somebody better, to make another child better. My personal challenge is when we lose a child as I was, a team. I was just about asking, yes. have you lost any oh, yes, cases certainly. and how many? Certainly. I, I wouldn't be able to count. Countless? Um, and, no, I wouldn't say countless, not at all. Um, the environments are very different mm. in which I trained. In the environment in which I trained, it was extremely rare to have somebody, you know, a child pass away. Okay. But, you know, this environment is very different um, and has more challenges and children are diagnosed later and have more complications in this environment compared to the Western environment. So the mortality and morbidity in this environment would be a little bit higher. And I tend to, I, I get emotional when, when I lose a patient or when something goes wrong with a patient. When was the last time you lost, you lost a patient? Oh, that was remember? on Sunday. Just this last Sunday, Sunday? Yes, Sunday gone. A yes. child? Yes, How a old? child. She was three, four months old. Yes, yes. She didn't have surgery, and that's one of the challenges. In fact, the biggest challenge you ask, actually, now that I think about it, is, is being in this environment, working in this environment. You know, in the Western environment, children are screened for heart problems. So every child with a heart problem is diagnosed okay. and has surgery by one year of age. In our environment, we don't screen our children. You know, we don't have a health program that screens children. And as a result of that, children get diagnosed fairly late. So they come with complications. And then we don't have everything that we ought to have from a, you know, a cardiac point to support children. So sometimes we diagnose certain diseases and we can't do anything about it. And this child that passed away on Sunday was one of these children. And my heart was so broken. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad. I, I'm I, sad I, was, I was extremely sad. I mean, sad I, I, because I, I, have, I have a six month old. Yes. So I know the feeling. You know, I had to, I mean, fortunately I was talking to the parents over the phone so I could tear up and they wouldn't see me. But when it's at work and I have to face the parent, I have to, you know, compose myself. But yes, I do shed tears mm. behind the scenes. Let's um, look at the severity of heart diseases in the country. Um, first of all, let's draw the line. Is it just, children you look at or you look at some adults too, how, how, how is the process like? Okay, so pediatric cardiology and to broaden it from a, a professional point, it would be pediatric and congenital cardiology. Okay. The congenital means that the children are born with the heart disease. So even an adult who has oh, a heart disease that was not even diagnosed in childhood would still fa fall under my radar. Okay. So let's say a child came with what we call a hole in the, um, an adult comes with a hole in the heart, they still belong, in quote, to me from a professional point um, because it's not an adult problem, it's really a pediatric problem that was not found. And even the pediatric pro um, children or pediatric problems that we find, cardiac problems, once, um, even when they grow, we still look after them. So we might see them when they're six, but after they've had surgery, we follow them up for life. So they become adults and they are still... So pediatric cardiology is very different to adult cardiology. They are two different, you know, specializations. They are not one that merges into the other. No, they are different. Okay. All right, so if you just tuned in, this is the Today's Woman show and uh, 
we have a superwoman here with us. She's in the person of uh, Dr. Nana Echa Yao, the only pediatric cardiologist. And the conversation has been quite exciting. But um, my spirits just dropped a bit when you, you, you spoke about the child you lost over the weekend. Right, so just tune in, that's it. And we are here at the Mervyn Peak Ambassador Hotel. And, well, these wonderful drinks you see in front of us. I'll be tasting it very soon. I understand this is the Aztec, if I got it right, and that is the Ambassador. So if you come into Mervyn Pig one-to-one -one bar, you would have a taste of exactly what I'm talking about. The conversation will continue now, and we would want to talk about women and development or empowerment, women climbing the ladder. First of all, let me pick your thoughts on that, career women and climbing the ladder. In, in terms of its professional? Yeah. I think it's very important to be intentional um, as a woman. And I mean, well, as any human being, but then more so as a woman, because I like there are that point. Yes, it's very. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but then I guess, um, you know, women, we have things that happen to us, um, you know, in terms of childbearing. Um, so that kind of takes us away or, you know, kind of changes the course of things in terms of career just a little bit. Um, and so it's, it's very important to be intentional, um, to know um, where you want to be, you know, and to have a roadmap and also to identify your potentials. Most of the time, I think both from, I think, an adult perspective as parents, as guardians, um, teachers, caregivers, we maybe don't identify the strengths in the youth around us. And we, or, or the youth, let me put it maybe the other way around. A lot of people don't tend not to have people to encourage them or to identify their strengths or to support their strengths. And so sometimes there are the youth or children around who have certain strengths, but there's no one to really guide them and you know, spare them on. But I think in terms of climbing the ladder, it's important to be intentional, it's important to plan, I think one of the greatest supports is, is, is family support. Um, because when you're a single woman, it's okay. Um, but when you get married, I think you need the support of your spouse, mm. you know, 200%. And I must say that I've had a very, 200%. yes, not 100, 200%, you know. I've had a very supportive spouse. I've had a very supportive so husband. So I'm sure you had the 200%. I had more than 200, <laughs> wow. I'm sure, yes. Because my husband can cook, he can clean, he can shop. He can look after the children. Oh, he, you're telling my story. Yes, he's very <laughs> domesticated. Ooh, so okay. yes, he's been. He's always been there, you know, over the years. Um, so that's uh, so that's 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 great and that's important because without the support, it is extremely challenging to do it by yourself because you're not you're 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 out there um, climbing the career ladder. Mm. But what about the home? Right. You know, and of course you must be able to juggle it in such a way that your kids, when that time comes, they also don't feel that, you know, they have an absent mother. They are not, where is mommy? You know, mommy only comes home and she's tired and she so doesn't. You, it makes you feel sort of irresponsible. That's not right. Not taking care of yes. the home too well. Yes, you know. So I had a, an extremely, extremely um, busy job as a junior doctor. You know, you did about, I worked over 72 hours a week sometimes. But the one thing for me that I always did, that any time I came home in the evening, I wanted to shower the children and put them to bed myself, you know, and that, 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 that was quality time, you know, and then the weekends that I wasn't working to be able to take them out, you know, and, and be interested in them. And I mean, parenting is progressive. Mm. When they became teenagers, I decided that they're going to be my friends and I'm not going to be their mother. And so I kind of went through their teenage years with them as well. And... I think that, that, that has been great help and encouraging on the family aspect. In the career ladder itself, it's important to say that this is the exam that I want to do, this is where I want to be, this is a job that I want to do, make the necessary contact and not to be intimidated as a woman. Mm. Yeah. Well, I've, I've just picked a lot from <laughs> the little that you've told me. But on that point then, I would ask you, who would you describe as today's woman? Today's woman... Um, I think above all, knows the Lord. Um, I am a Christian and I think that is the most important thing in life for me. Today's woman um, identifies her strengths and her weaknesses and works on her weaknesses. Today's woman is the woman who 
despite you know the intense professionalism and professional busyness, mm. is able to delegate responsibly. And I think one of the important things is that as a professional, you can get so busy and you can do it so well that you forget that you can delegate and make things a little bit easier and a little bit better. Um, today's woman strives to be better, seeks positive criticism, and gets better all the time. In my opinion, that is today's woman. Right. <laughs> I'm sure you would ask me why, why I'm smiling. That, that first point that you made, that yeah. it means that with God, everything is Absolutely. doable and possible. Absolutely. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, Nana and herself. Me time. Do you have? Do you actually have something like a me time, considering the profession you have? I must be very honest that I don't. Um, and my daughter asked me a similar question, and I said I work till I drop, which is very bad. <laughs> it's 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 not good, and particularly you know as the years you know creep on, it's certainly not the best way to live. So recently, I'm trying to create me time for myself. Um, but the interesting thing about me, or the strange thing about me, if I should put it that way, is that the things that I love to do are cycling and then reading. And if I'm too tired to cycle, that means that I'm just reading. So I really like to be just by myself, mm -hmm. just me and me. Just that's it. That's my me time. So yeah. you said you were doing something. Can you can you share with us exactly what you do? Do you take your leave for the year, or you don't go on leave at all? Considering you're the only uh, pediatric cardiologist. In um, I I. I do go on leave, but when I go on leave, it's to go and um, kind of look after the children or support the children. So or it's do still something. working. It's still working. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It, it really is working. Mm. Um, but yes. And yeah, so me time is, it's, 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 um, I'm on the learning curve when that okay. is concerned. Yes. Okay. But aside that, how do you also handle the family bit, normal life bit, your social life bit? How, how do you juggle all this together? Um, I think the most important aspect of my social life is actually church. So that is very important in terms of when I go. Any I important mean, roles you play? Um, at the moment, uh, not really. I, I do lead Bible study. Okay. Um, it's it's yes. an important role. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but yes, and then I, I, I make sure in terms of like I, do, I don't just do Sundays. I do weekday services as well and mm -hmm. weekday prayer meetings um, as much as I can. Um, then, in terms, other than that, and then it's really home. From a contact point, uh, my family know that they can reach me all the time, in any time, and so any time I see a call from them, I will stop whatever I'm doing to at attend to them, or if I can't, I get somebody to take the call. Um, and I would m make a huge effort to talk to every member of my family okay. every single day you know, at, at, at length, at least to find out how has your day been, you know, so, so that we don't lose touch because mm. it's easy to lose touch. You see why I say you're a superwoman? <laughs> you're juggling everything <laughs> into one, which is not easy. But uh, I would want to go back to the issue of the heart diseases yes. and the fact that there are no screenings done in yes. the country. Yeah. How would you want government to approach this? Has any step been taken at all with yeah. regards to this uh, problem mm. we have in the country? Well, from a national level, um, I don't really think so. The thing is, when a hundred children are born, one child has a heart problem. Um, so if you look at Kolebu, where we have about 9,000 deliveries a year, you can imagine, for every you know, hundred children, one child will have a heart problem. Um, the children need to be screened, and to a great extent, it comes back to our manpower and organization, because the country in general has got a shortage of doctors. The doctors are overworked, you know, in general pediatrics, in obstetrics. So that's the challenging bit. But however, I think it's a matter of us, you know, planning it, thinking about it, because I don't think it is an impossibility. The other challenging aspect, because of course, if it's not diagnosed early, then it's diagnosed late, and then they have complications. And then the biggest challenge is the financial support. You know, a single, you know, open heart operation cost about $6,000, you know, um, CD equivalent at the National Cardiothoracic Center. Now, how many Ghanaians have got $6,000 sitting in their pockets? Mm -hmm. And if someone's child is diagnosed with a heart problem and they have to find $6,000 to fund that, it becomes frantic, it becomes distressing. So you tell them the cost and then they go away and then they come back sometimes a year later, sometimes two years later with 
more complications. And sometimes we can't even operate on the children because it's a little bit too late. So from you know, our you know, government aspect, it would be great to have a fund you know, from the government that supports children with heart disease. Then we could operate on more children, support more children, you know, uh, get people to train in the specialties, the supporting specialties, which, which are so important. Because my job really is just at the beginning, well, not just, but I find the children. Then my colleagues, my surgical colleagues, will do the operation. And then after the operation, the children come back to me for ongoing care. Um, you know, then we have the intensivists and the anesthetists. So it's, it's, it's teamwork. Mm. Um, having, yes, being the only, well, pediatric cardiologist, there are what we we'll, would say pediatricians with a special interest in pediatric cardiology, um, you know, dotted around the country. And they also really support when it comes to pediatric cardiology. Okay. So you're spoken about teamwork, you're spoken about support, and I know you are the only pediatric cardiologist. Let's look at mentoring, issues of mentoring. Are there any... Uh, junior doctors, if I should put it, you're mentoring. Are there any people looking up to you that if Dr. Yao is not around, if she's traveled, who takes her place? Is there any arrangement of that sort yes. as, as currently in Ghana? Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, there are two um, doctors who um, have been able to train um, at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital Department of Child Health. Um, and that's, you know, and that's been really voluntary. I mean, they were interested in it. They wanted to do it and they sought it out and they have done very well over the years. The thing about pediatric cardiology is that it's, it's a difficult specialty to train in. It doesn't take six months to a year. It takes at the bare minimum two years to become competent. Um, and so it has been challenging, but yes, they, they have done extremely well. Um, it's not, um, there's training and there's experience. So they can look at most things, but then there are other things that we will discuss together. So yes, when I'm not there, there is, I mean, there are the two guys, um, you know, Dr. Adela Josi and Dr. Usu Setre, who, you know, can do most things. And you know, they will call, even when I'm holiday, they will still call and we will discuss <laughs> by video and look at things by video call. So yes. Okay. All right. We'll be wrapping everything up soon, but I would want you to give some little, um, should I say, motivational talk to today's woman. What would you tell today's woman? Um, today's woman, I would say that stay in tune with yourself. Be very, very true to yourself. Um, the priority, I believe, in life is to know, to know the Lord and to seek your purpose. Because today's woman, you are unique and you have your own purpose. Your purpose is not like the next woman. And to run with that purpose and to accomplish the goal to seek support, um, you know, and to, to strengthen our weaknesses. I think that's, that's very important because you can only get better when you listen to positive critique and then you apply it. So you heard it all from today's woman, our superwoman for today. And she is Dr. Nanae Chayao, the only pediatric cardiologist. Remember, today's, today's woman was brought to you by uh, GTP, Yaz, as well as Mervyn Pick Ambassador Hotel. I'd also like to say thank you to Mervyn Pick One to One Bar who uh, brought us these drinks. This is Aztec and what Dr. Yao has in front of her. I would want to taste mine. I'm sure she would also want to have a sip of hers. <laughs> yes. Just a little, Just if a you little. don't mind. Yeah. So this is the Aztec and uh, what Dr. Yao has is the Ambassador. Cheers cool. to a break. Cheers. Yep. Right. Cheers. <laughs> We're taking a break. We'll be right back. You're welcome back from the break. This is today's woman. We still have Dr. Nana Echa Yao here, and uh, we would like to say a very big thank you for spending time with us on the show, for your motivation, for the insights, and telling us who today's woman is. Well, this is something small we have from our sponsors. He has uh, a whole package of it just to say thank, thank you. you to you for the insights, for uh, things you've told us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm very humbled and blessed to have been here. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> right, so this has been today's woman. would like to say a very big thank you to Mervyn Pick Ambassador Hotel, also to GTP, 
and Yaz. My name is Nana Ikuya Mensah Rampa. We'll be back with more next week. Have a good day.